at any point, please just just jump in. So first of all, if I, if I do this correctly. So I'm uh, Melanie Oldham, I'm the boss at Bob's Business, and we are a cybersecurity awareness training company. So we help organizations of all sizes, from five employees up to sort of 70, 80 odd thousand, uh, to raise awareness of information security. Everything from techn technology companies, retail organizations, uh, to central government, uh, delivering everything from monthly awareness campaigns, predominantly online, through to phishing awareness campaigns as well. We ourselves have hold a number of certifications, ISO 27001, Cyber Essentials Plus and, and IASME Gold. And there's a, there's a theory that comes into this, is why do people actually go down the certification route? Did I do certification with a view to um, enable information security and better practices in my business, or did I actually do it as a tick box exercise? If I'm blatantly honest, when I went down the 27001 route, it was because one, I could secure funding that paid for the consultant to do it, and two, because delivering information security awareness training uh, in this sector, I wanted to be seen as a secure provider. However, the back end of that, sort of two, three years on, is I really do believe that the standards, 27001, Cyber Essentials, really do help with um, digital adoption, um, business growth, and have really helped support the growth of the business. So I think sometimes, from a provider point of view, we look more at the compliance angle and the tick box uh, than we do actually the business benefits. And I think, you know, I'm quite passionate that there's a this shift that needs to happen there, and we need to look at actually how do these standards Standards, how do these, these groups that exist actually benefit businesses rather than just looking to be seen to be doing the right thing? And it's the same, uh, obviously, with GDPR as well. Okay. So, oh, whew, hang on one second. We seem to have jumped quite a few. Bear with me. Okay. So... Okay, so we all have uh, one weakness in common. What is it? Anybody know the weaknesses? Yep, which is us. Okay, we're the, the, the biggest weakness without a shadow of a doubt. When I first did this, this presentation, it was, quite, it was quite good because actually we were looking at 95% of breaches being as a result of human error, but the latest statistics, if you to, to drill down, is saying 62%. So arguably, it's, it's getting better, so we must be doing something right. Um, either that or the reports that I had a, a couple of years ago were probably, um, yeah, very generous from a marketing point of view. So all the errors are caused by, caused by human. And the, the question is that, why? And our frontline defenders, why do our frontline defenders cause us so much problems? And my, my biggest thing is, is, is because of what powers us. We're powered predominantly by emotions, feelings, uh, sensitivities, and it's those that get exploited. It's, it's those that criminals actually feed on. So criminals are, are greedy, they want more, they want re respect, they want repetition. Um, reputational um, notoriety and things like that. And from a, p a personal point of view, it's, it's down to our emotions of what makes us susceptible. Am I talking too fast? No, to yes, say. by all means, yeah, please. So you choose the number of 62% of errors are human? Yes, correct. Do you now want to say that you should reduce this number by training humans, or is it a problem of the system that is put in place that allows a human to do wrong things? Um, I would argue a bit of both, and that's what I'm, I'm, I will hopefully to cover, but I do think, I think a lot of it comes down to, um, again, which I'll touch on in a minute, is communication, the way that we deliver messages, the, the responsibility we do and we don't put on end users, uh, but also people doing things by, by, by mistake and by error. Did you want to? Yeah. Okay. So obviously the biggest problem with users is they can't be um, fixed, patched, or monitored to the, well, arguably they can increasingly now be monitored, and it's, uh, you know, being able to monitor user behavior is predominantly growing the biggest strength. I sat in a seminar on the other side of the room talking about how we can monitor and predict user behavior to stop them doing it, but ultimately what I'd like to sort of say is because we are all, all slightly different in a way, I think it's important that we try and work out how, what, what makes us click. Okay, so... Why are we the weakest link? A uh, number of reasons is that we'll argue that we're too busy. We're all busy trying to do jobs, and so much gets asked of us. Uh, when somebody sends an email home to their personal email account, are so they doing it because they want to cause damage to the business, or are they doing it because they don't feel they've got enough time in their day to do the work that they need to do? Um, so we're all just too busy. We don't have time to do awareness training. We, how can we possibly fit it in? And it's about finding solutions that will fit in, in amongst our day-to-day -day operations that actually don't seem overly taxing 
happening and are uh, uh, sort of there as without a great deal of thought and effort. Um, what I was talking to a chap in the in the bar last night, talking about the impacts of. Um, training and, and awareness can have and it's very much saying that actually if you can t tap into a small element people's behaviour will change ultimately across the board. So for example this gentleman was talking about putting in classification systems on emails and what happened within the organisation is there was an instant reduction in uh, clear desk, clear screen and also in their, in their behaviours in tailgating. Why would, why would email classification affect tailgating and why would it affect clear desk and clear screen? And it's because we're putting information security at the forefront of people's minds. So it's about delivering messages in a really timely fashion for people that are exceptionally busy in, in what they're doing. Um, people are not interested. Um, they don't. They see it as a big thing, a big thing that isn't to concern them. It's something, and again, this comes down to the way that we put information security across in an organisation. Whose responsibility is information security? Is it seen something that sits wholly with the compliance teams, the IT teams, and therefore it's their responsibility? So therefore, should end users be interested, or should they be of the belief that technology has everything covered? Um, and again, I will touch on relationships within organisations and the, and the barriers that exist that actually have created that that void. Okay. Okay. So people being resistant to change. Um, I would argue this is less and less of a problem. People do say people don't like change, but I think what you will find with the, the younger generations, we are so adaptable. Things are changing on a regular, regular basis. So this is an argument as to why people can't adopt information security awareness, to me, is, is one that's, that's slowly dying out and one that won't exist because people are very good with change. They are very susceptible, and it's something that we need to, to, to take into consideration. Um, no personal connection, it will never happen to me. Um, many of the, one of the failings of a, a number of organisations we, we work with and the people say, well, it's, it's never going to happen to me, it won't happen. But obviously, you guys are in the information security field and you know that this is an archaic saying. So what we've inherited is a number of um, beliefs, a number of sayings that are legacy ones that we just need to, to, to die off uh, because ultimately it does happen to everybody. And what we fail to do with our messaging, especially in information security awareness and when it comes to GDPR, is generalizing the messages and what you tend to find is people make everything really generic and therefore people find it difficult to have that personal connection they find it difficult to see how it could happen to them and it doesn't take a lot to sit somebody down I'm sure pretty much any of the information security professionals in here could sit down and find something that would relate to a person if they spoke to them and said okay you know, if I turn this, looking at it from your perspective, what information do you hold? What is, is important to you? What risk assessments do you do on a daily basis? You'd find something. And uh, people feel that that's something that's really hard to achieve, but I'll, I'll talk about how we can achieve that as well. Okay. So, as I touched on, people generally don't do things with the intention of, of, of causing uh, malicious damage. People generally do things uh, with a view to, to wanting to do a good job, to wanting to please and not cause harm. And this is something to, to bear in mind when we're implementing information security awareness because more often than not, organisations think that coming a bit heavy-handed Enforcing things as, as being mandatory, fishing people out of the blue is, is, is as acceptable. But what you're doing is you're presenting quite aggressive behaviour for people that aren't intending to do things maliciously. You know, as, as a child, I, I, I learnt yesterday from a, um, a cyber trauma specialist that actually there is the, the relationship that we have uh, with our telephones uh, probably potentially stems from when we are small and the way that we trust stems from when we, we are that tiny baby and when your mother holds your holds your baby uh, when they're when they're tiny there's that distance that three 30 centimeter distance and it's the send and receive a baby gives you a, a noise you give the noise back and it's that send and receive that builds that trust so we've got an inherent trust with anything that's 30 centimeters away from us and apparently you you know, funnily enough, where do we hold most of our mobile phones? So we've got this inherent trust with this mobile phone that is so close to our faces. So it makes you question, okay, so what would have potentially, you know, what built up our trust in the past? Is it something that's actually ingrained in us in the way that we're born, in the way that we're, we're brought up, that we're actually now transferring onto digital devices that respond with us, that have emotions, that talk to us? So how we, you know, how we do that, and that is not something that is, 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 is causing, you know, in seen as trust untrustworthy, malicious. It tends to be people want that, that, that interaction. Okay. Um, 
So how do we um, build frontline defenders and engage the disengaged people and change people's current behaviour? Because if 62% of employees are causing us a headache, how do we change what we do with them uh, if we can't sort of patch them uh, per se? Right. So there is that common uh, misconception that fear is an enabler to security. Um, to a business owner, potentially it might be, but to an employee, it has really ram uh, negative ramifications. So you're sitting there, you know, in an organisation who's doing a, a phishing awareness campaign. Why would you would you go about sending phishing emails to to staff and? trying to catch them out. I would put the gauntlet down that any organisation that delivers phishing awareness and or uh, phishing simulations could fish me if they really, really wanted to. It's, it's a given. What you need to do in your education awareness is not prove that you can fish somebody. You need to give them the tools and the understanding to change their behaviour, to recognise what they're doing. So, in terms of the sort of the, the phishing side, what can happen there is if you do a, a phishing awareness campaign, you get a metric, but that metric is probably on par with what you already know in the industry. You know your level of risk. It might help you with, with board buy-in, but in terms of the impact that, that can have on the employee, it can be quite negative. Um, there's been a, a number of cases from, again, again, from the, the cyber trauma side of it, of the effect that that can have on people being caught out. What you're doing is you're then building barriers between IT and the end users that you've then got to try and break down. What you're trying to do in the information security field, hopefully, is give, empower people, give people the knowledge, so that if something happens, they come to you immediately. When an incident breaks, you want them to turn to you as, a, as an organization, as an IT team, straight away. But if you're going to sort of try and catch them out and try and deceive them and give them that element of fear, why would they come to you? It goes against anything, everything that's ingrained in us, which is to come to those people that you trust. So you need to think about how you deliver messages, how you communicate with end users in order for them to, to respond to you in a positive way so that in the event of a breach, you can, you can turn that around and, and, and react accordingly. So, to achieve positive change, you need to deliver messages in a, a, a way that employees can understand and relate to. So here are my sort of tips, how do we engage the disengaged? Marketing. One of the things that information security uh, teams do not do is work cross-collaboratively across organisations. Information security is predominantly a, from a user behaviour point of view is a user behaviour issue. How do you engage with people? You engage with people by making things look attractive, by giving it a positive brand, by making sure that it's, it's, it's recognised by those users as something that they actually want to do. Information security, my, my background, just to give you a little bit of understanding, is I was very much in hospitality tourism and marketing sector and moved into project management and I moved into uh, an IT team of 13 techies and instantly felt uncomfortable, instantly felt that you guys were far more intelligent than I could ever be. Um, and then I was tasked with trying to get the messages from their heads into the organisation that I worked for. And it was actually the, the behaviours that you're trying to get these uh, end users to adopt are not technical. It's very much about the behaviour, you know, don't click on a link, question who, what's coming through to you, you know, don't write your passwords down, so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's not technically very, very difficult. So what you need to do is try and market it, those messages, and the best teams potentially to do that are your marketing teams. Have you engaged with your marketing teams to try and put out messages on information security awareness? Because you wouldn't go to market with a product that you're going to sell without making sure it's attractive to the end users, so why wouldn't you make information security attractive? Have you ever engaged with your marketing team to do your cybersecurity and how did that how did that that play out uh, my was a techie. he was a techie okay but in terms of the response from end users did it change the the way that they perceive and see things the other thing with it is is to make sure you plan. You don't expect anything to be successful till you plan. You wouldn't implement a, a software rollout without ensuring that you've got testing in there, without ensuring that it's gone through um, sort of a test pilot. Make sure that on your, your marketing, your awareness, that you're actually putting the plan together of what you hope to achieve and how you hope to achieve it. Under a GDPR, one of the things that you'll, we need to evidence is whether or not the, uh, what we're implementing actually has a, a change on the organisation. Is it actually having an impact? With information security awareness training, 
it's argued particularly they are um, vanity matrix in that you can tell how many people have actually completed the training, how many people haven't, and what score they've got. But does that actually truly show you true behavioral change? And it doesn't. So one thing you need to make sure is that actually before you implement your awareness campaign, are, from an instant response point of view, are you capturing human-related errors? Do you know how many breaches you've, you have? One thing you'll find from implementing an awareness campaign is the moment that you implement it is you'll have a spike in, in, in breaches. And that's not because you've suddenly got more insecure. It's because people actually understand what a breach is. To an end user, knowing what a breach is is, is alien. So you need to sort of break that down. OK. Make it relevant, explain it to your employees, make it emotional, make it personal, and align it to their, their values. Think about, in terms of your, your training materials, everything is the same. <coughs> Password management is the same whether you're seven or you're 70. It's the same messages you're getting across. So try putting out messages that they can take home, that they can use um, within the home environment to teach their kids, and by default, they will then, then pick that up. Okay. Uh, social influencing and the power of the people, really, really effective. Um, I think previously when I was talking, I mentioned about sort of doing a test, agreed. I think a pilot scheme within an organization is always good to find out how things are, are, are going to be received. But the power of the people is really, really effective. If you're going to roll out a campaign, make sure you roll it across the whole of the organization. And think about breaking down certain topics into sort of bite-sized chunks. So one month you might do passwords, the next month you might do viruses. Use your social media to your advantage. Uh, we recently ran a... a the last sorry, two years, we've run a, a phishing awareness and education campaign with HMRC. And one of the most effective things was to, to, to go out and tell them what we're going to do and why we're going to do it, that we want their support. HR th are there to support you and help you, but also to remember that actually, how are we going to manage and cope with in incidents when they come in? So it allows you to do that test environment. But the far thing that shone out of the whole campaign was the interaction between users. So when an email campaign would go out, people would get on and they would tell people this email is, is, is coming. That was coming from peer to peer. And people would argue, well, if, if you're doing a phishing test, you don't want people to talk. You do so want people to talk because if that was in the live environment, the moment that happens, you want people to talk about it and you want them to report it. The other thing as well is one, one chap on, on, on Yammer decided to put... I've received this phishing email, I've landed on the, the I've, I've been directed to do some training, I don't have time for this rubbish. To which his colleagues then responded, well you're the absolute reason we're doing this training, you're the idiot that clicked on the link. That is far more effective coming from your colleague that sits next to you than being chastised from the top down. So again, thinking how you use social media, interacting with people and, and showing that face is, is really, really important and making sure that you know, there's a collaborative effort from HR, from marketing, and from IT to make sure that that campaign has real support, because nothing will be successful unless it has the, uh, the support of all, all parties, all stakeholders. Okay. Prezi has a tendency to make you feel a little bit sick. Keep it simple. No jargon, keep it concise, bite size, make it memorable, and reinforce it. It's that reinforcement piece. The way that we learn is building blocks. Every single time we get a new piece of information, we add to it. The problem you have is if you go in too complicated, too quick, people become disengaged, they're not interested, they switch off, and then your ability to pull them back is so, so very difficult. So make sure that you, 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 you keep it simple. The fun theory. Have any, has anybody seen this, this video? I'll, yeah, so basically, yeah, so it was um, a, a social experiment in Sweden uh, to see how they could start engaging with people, to get people to use the stairs rather than the, uh, the escalator. Just over screen. It's got no, no video, oh, it's got no audio. So in essence, what they, what they did over, over time was try and get more people to do it by making it fun. And this is exactly the same thing, you know. We, we, we use um, gamification, we give out goodies as part of our, our training. And do people really do awareness training with the chance to win, you know, a mug, a mouse mat? The reality is they do. It's a bit like the cuddly toys um, for, for insurance. And uh, this here is, is a fantastic experiment they did. And they literally converted the whole... It's a shame you've not got the music because it is really delightful music. But it's... Um, have I got it on here? I don't think I have, but I'd, I'd definitely recommend that you, you go back and, um, and possibly have a look at it. 
but the impact of actually making something fun and a bit different. They didn't move the staircase, they didn't change its location, they just made it more attractive and more appealing. And more, and pe more people used the stairs. So, quickly, conscious of time. 66% of people used the stairs more when they were made more, more engaging than they were previously. Um, okay, so typical engagement rates with e-learning is 8 to 10%, and that's really, really poor. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to there sell you an e-learning product, and actually, you know, if, it's, if the engagement statistics are really that low, why would I do it? And the reality is, if you, if you pitch it right and you communicate it well, you can get engagement statistics of 85 plus, which is what we've achieved. And how have we done this? We've done this by using animation. Storytelling is a really, really powerful means. And asking people in the organization, have they ever been victims, and coming forward with their own stories, again, will get people to buy in and get people to understand it. Making sure that you're aligning your training with your policy and making your policies immediately available. Again, one of the biggest mistakes organizations make is put the policies onto intranets where they never get accessed. Why not roll them out at the point at which you do the, the training in relation to those certain areas, whether it be passwords? Uh, so on and so forth. Try to make it um, the same. Use your marketing teams to market it and make sure that you're testing it. Okay, conscious of time. So, by enabling security in, um, awareness is increase your engagement. That will lead to better adoption of best practices, which will lead to uh, behavioral change in your organization and hopefully help secure your organization. So, communicate, explain, and make it attractive. Lots to take in there, and I could go on for hours, but is there any questions at all? Yes? The question is uh, about the mentality of uh, the audience. Uh, British people, speakers, Latvians, of course, uh, how do you take that into account? Yeah, I think when you're using humor, you might find that that is a... Is you know, it, it does slightly differ, but when you're talking about the other messages of marketing it, keep it simple, make sure it's jargon-free, and collaborate, that's the same regardless of, of the language barriers. Uh, what you tend to find, though, is animation works really, really well across many many divides. You'll find The Simpsons that are watched, you know, in many, many countries, as is Scooby-Doo, and their animated approach, and they've got humor that are based predominantly over in America, but it, it still translates translates well, people are still interested because it's got that visual appeal and that attraction that actually makes it feel a little bit different. And that's what you want. You want people to grab their attention. And you know, some people may argue, Bob can be a little bit Marmite. You either love him or you hate him, but you're still talking about him. So therefore, he's having that, that impact that you'd like. Okay, any other questions? Thank you very much.